All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our latest RBT exam practice question set. Today we're going to go through this set together and break the questions down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out or a card. Study hard. Let's get going. An extension procedure is written into the treatment plan for one of your clients to use at home. Your supervisor tells you and the parents that there is likely going to be behavior contrast. What does your supervisor expect to happen as a result of extinction? A couple things going on here. First, we are using extinction in the home and the supervisor believes that behavior contrast is going to be a result of the extinction procedure. So if we start with the extinction procedure, what do we expect to happen if we implement extinction? Well, we expect behavior to probably temporarily increase first, go through an extinction burst, but ultimately decrease, right? Extinction is a, is a method we use to decrease behavior. So if our supervisor thinks the behavior is going to decrease at home due to extinction and that there will be behavior contrast, what does the supervisor think is going to happen? To know this, you have to understand what behavior contrast is, and this is part of your vocabulary, and this is why you must be fluent. Behavior contrast occurs when a behavior in one setting is either either reduced or increased, and it goes the opposite way in a different setting due to the change in reinforcement in one setting. Essentially, if we decrease the behavior in one setting, there's a good chance it's going to increase in another, and vice versa. So what do we expect to happen? A, the behavior will not decrease in the home setting but will in another setting. No, if we're gonna use extinction, the supervisor expects the behavior to decrease in the home. Remember, we are in home. B, the behavior is going to increase in all settings. Most likely not, we're gonna use extinction, right? So there might be a temporary increase, but ultimately, if we're using extinction, we expect the behavior to decrease. Extinction is a decreasing procedure. C, the behavior will increase at home and decrease in another setting. Again, no, we don't think it's going to increase at home. C is behavior contrast, however, so we're closer. D is what we're looking for. The behavior will decrease at home due to extinction, and due to behavior contrast, it's going to increase in another setting. So the behavior is going to go in the opposite direction in the other setting. Now, how do you combat that? Well, you've got to make sure that everybody is on the same page across all settings and using similar and the same types of schedule. Ultimately though, we think the behavior is going to decrease at home and that it will increase in another setting. Peter is getting back in shape and wants to run a 5K in 18 minutes. Yesterday, he ran a seven minute mile. The day before, he ran an eight minute mile. Today, he ran a mile in six minutes and 30, or six thirty minutes, six minutes and 30 seconds. What is Peter tracking relative to his time? All right, so we have Peter and he's going to run a 5K in 18 minutes. And we need to know relative to his times what he is tracking because Peter wants to get his mileage down. Okay, if he has to run 3.1 miles, then to achieve 18 minutes, he's got to run each mile in a certain amount of time. So we know we have a six and a half minute mile, we have an eight minute mile, and we have a seven minute mile. What is Peter tracking? What is he keeping track of? What is he comparing? A, rate. Well, rate is what? Rate is frequency plus time. Do we have frequency? Is Peter counting anything? He's not, right? He's looking at how long each mile is. So there is no rate, right? There's no frequency per time, right? It isn't like miles per day or anything like that. He's not even looking at necessarily an average. He's, he's looking at a seven minute mile. The mile took seven minutes. He's looking at an eight minute mile, the mile took eight minutes. He's looking at a mile that took six and a half minutes. So he's looking at total time, right? So B, frequency, obviously, if we don't have rate, and we don't have frequency, we can't pick frequency. We have to go with C, duration, right? He's looking at duration, okay? Seven minute mile, how long did the mile take? Seven minutes. Duration is the length of a response. So each mile is our response. We have an eight minute mile is our duration, seven minute mile is our duration, and then six and a half minutes is our duration for this mile. Peter is tracking duration relative to his time. Remember D, latency. Latency is just the time in between the SD and the response. We're not tracking time in between SDs 
and responses, we're tracking, we're tracking duration, or the total length of time that each response is taking. And since he's tracking miles, he's tracking total time each mile is taking, therefore Peter is tracking duration. Jasmine taught at a public elementary school before she started as a behavior technician. She knows several of the parents from the school and knows that some of them receive services from the ABA company Jamie works for now. What should Jamie be aware of given this information? All right, we've got an ethical question and we have Jamie who has a situation where she taught at a school before she started as a technician. And as a result, she knows several parents from the school and knows that many of them or some of them receive ABA from the company Jimmy works for. So what does that mean? What, why is that important? Well, there's a good chance, right, that she, if she knows the parents, there's a good chance she knows the children. She might even be friendly with some of these parents. We don't know her social standing. And what's the rule as far as taking clients and multiple relationships and conflicts of interest? We don't work as technicians or supervisors for personal friends, right? We can't have a personal relationship and a professional relationship when working according to the ethical code. Okay. They consider that a multiple relationship. We can't do it. So what does Jamie need to be aware of if there's a potential that could happen? A, Jamie needs to be aware of multiple relationships. Absolutely. And cut off all social ties with parents. Well, no, Jamie doesn't have to cut off social ties or any social ties she might have with parents. She just can't go ahead and take these cases, right? If there's a social relationship with the parent, then that's gonna prevent her from being the technician on the case. That's just what it is. B, Jamie might need to consider leaving her current place of employment. No, unless there's a chance that all these kids Jamie knew or taught previously, there's no reason for her to leave her current place of employment. She needs to, just get, she needs to get different cases. C, Jamie should work as a technician on some of those cases since she is already familiar with the families. It's actually the opposite, right? Now, if Jamie is strictly in a professional relationship with these parents, that's a different story. But if Jamie has any sort of social contact, any sort of personal relationship, she can't be the technician on the cases. So we look at D, Jamie should avoid working on those cases if she has a social relationship with any of the families. Yes, this is what we've been looking for, right? Now, we don't know all the information, but based on the information, and you're always just answering each question based on the information given. And based on the information given, she has to be aware of that she needs to avoid working on cases if she has a social relationship with the families. If she doesn't and it's strictly professional, that's a whole different story, right? But Given the information, she must avoid working on cases if she has a social relationship with any of the families. Jimmy Butler, after winning game two of the NBA Finals, was asked what drives him to compete so hard. Butler said, I want to hold the championship trophy. That's all I want. What is the cause of Jimmy's competitiveness? Now, when we talk about cause, we're, we're a lot of times talking about function, right? Function is the reason behavior occurs. And our four primary functions are what? We have escape, tangible, attention, and automatic. Now this one I think is pretty straightforward. It's a pretty easy question in my opinion. Okay, so we're looking at the cause of Jimmy's competitiveness. Okay, because that was the question asked. They asked what drives to compete so hard? What is the reason Jimmy's competitive? And he says, I want to hold the championship trophy. So holding the championship trophy causes the competitiveness. So that's what we're kind of looking for here. So A, the desire to win. So desire is not measurable, it's not observable, it's not even mentioned here. Desire is not a reason or a cause of a behavior, right? So A is just not a good answer. B, the attention he will gain from fans and media. Attention is a function, it is a cause or a reason of behavior. But we don't talk about attention or attention is not mentioned in the information given. Remember, we must use the information given. So C, obtaining the tangible item he wants. And based on what he said, I want to hold the trophy. He wants to obtain this tangible. He wants to obtain the trophy. So what is the cause of Jimmy's competitiveness? Well, most likely C, obtaining the tangible item he wants. When looking at function, you've got to look at the whole picture, the antecedents and the consequences, and ask yourself, why, why is this behavior occurring? What are they trying to gain? What are they trying to get rid of? 
Jimmy's trying to gain the championship trophy. He's trying to gain this tangible. Gracie is desperately trying to quit smoking. She quits about a thousand times at this point and feels as if she had tried everything. A friend recommends to Gracie that she should put a rubber band on her wrist and then pop the rubber band each time she thinks about smoking. If Gracie does this and it decreases her smoking, what has Gracie utilized? So a lot going on here, long question. Remember, we always attack the question first. We don't jump to the answer choices. So let's analyze the question. Looking at Gracie and this intervention, and most importantly, we're assuming it decreases her smoking, right? Because it says if Gracie does this and it decreases her smoking. So we're looking in the context of it actually decreasing her smoking. Well, we know she's trying to quit and she's tried everything. So the friend says, put a rubber band on your wrist and then pop the rubber band each time she thinks about smoking. So she thinks about smoking, right? As a consequence, she pops the rubber band. And we're assuming popping the rubber band is decreasing the smoking. So immediately, when you know a consequence has decreased a response or a behavior, right? What are we immediately thinking? Okay. Now, it says decreases her smoking, right? And the response is thinking about smoking. But if it decreases her smoking, because if she previously thought about smoking and actually smoked, it's still decreasing her behavior. Okay. Again, we're just using the information given, right? So we're looking at that word decreases, which is the key word and decreases means what does it mean? Reinforcing or punishing. It means punishing, right? If something decreases, we're dealing with punishment full stop. Okay. So we know it's going to be a punishment procedure. If we look at C and D, we have socially mediated negative reinforcement and automatic negative reinforcement. What's wrong with those? Reinforcement is never punishment, right? Negative reinforcement a lot of times is mischaracterized as some sort of punishing thing. If it's reinforcing, what is it doing to the behavior? It's increasing, right? Gracie's behavior has decreased. Her behavior has been punished. So then we have to ask ourselves, okay, is it socially mediated or automatic, right? So consequences can be socially mediated or automatic. They can be positive or negative, right? And they can be punishment or consequences. So we know it's positive, okay? Cause she's popping the rubber band. She's adding the stimulus of the, the pain or the pop or whatever the rubber band is causing. Now is it socially mediated or automatic? Well, what's the difference? Socially mediated is when the consequence is administered by somebody else. There's somebody else involved. In this case, who's administering the consequence? Well, Gracie's administering the consequence to herself. She's doing the popping. There's nobody else around. Her friend told her about the intervention, but now Gracie is giving herself the consequence. And if you provide yourself with the consequence, we know that's got to be automatic or alone, right? So we know it's automatic. We know it's positive because it's added. And we know it's punishment because it's decreasing. So if Gracie does this based on this information and it decreases her smoking, Gracie has utilized automatic positive punishment. Julian's mom works from home and has a standing meeting every day at 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. Julian will engage in attention-seeking behavior when at home, so Julian's mom plays with Julian and talks with Julian for 20 minutes before each of her meetings. Julian's mom is using what type of intervention? So we're looking at whose behavior? Julian's mom. When we have two or more pe people, right, in the situation, we've got to think about who we're looking at. We're looking at Julian's mom. We know she works from home, has a meeting, 9 a.m., 2 p.m., Okay. And Julian, importantly, will engage in attention seeking behavior. So what does Julian's mom do? Remember, we're looking at her behavior. She plays with Julian and talks with Julian for 20 minutes prior to each of her meetings. So what is she doing? Okay. She's being proactive, right? She knows Julian will engage in attention seeking behavior. So what she's trying to do is be proactive give Julian the attention and try and decrease the value of attention. Therefore, try to prevent Julian from engaging in attention seeking behavior, right? This is like non-contingent reinforcement. Okay. No matter what, before each meeting at nine and two, she's going to play with Julian for 20 minutes. So what type of intervention is that? A, an antecedent intervention. Yes, this is proactive, right? She's trying to prevent it's preventative. Antecedent interventions are preventative and they're proactive. Julian's mom is being proactive prior to her, me her meetings. 
B, consequence intervention. Consequence interventions are reactive, right? They're trying to, they're, they're reacting to what has already occurred. Julian's mom is doing this prior to the attention-seeking behavior happening. C, punishment. It can't be punishment because it's not a consequence intervention, so we can eliminate punishment. And then D, functional communication training. Well, we're not getting any indication information that Julian's mom is teaching communication, so we can rule that out. Julian's mom is being proactive, she's being preventative, and she's engaging in an antecedent intervention to try to avoid the intention-seeking behavior while she's in a meeting. Billy is probing his client's ability to tie their shoes correctly and independently. Billy gives the client six chances to tie the shoes. The client is able to do it independently two times. Billy records 33% accuracy for tying shoes. What type of measurement did Billy likely use? All right, we have a measurement question, okay? And we're looking at what Billy's measuring and what type of measurement he's using specifically. So we know he's probing, meaning he's just trying to figure out, can the client do it, can they not? Can they tie their shoes correctly independently? Can they not? He gives the client six chances, okay? The client can do it two times independently. So his data says 33% accuracy. Now, how did he get that number? Well, he took the two times that the client was able to do it, and he divided it by the uh, chances or the opportunities. So when we take a percentage based on successful responses given an amount of opportunities, what is that called? And it's, it's pretty obvious as you'll see, right? So A, trials to criterion. Well, with trials to criterion, we actually set a mastery criterion and we record how many trials it takes to reach. So if Billy says mastery is three independent times in a row and it takes the client seven trials to do that, that's trials to criterion. Here we have a percentage, right? B, rate, well, we don't have frequency over time, okay? What we're looking at is percentage of opportunities. We have our opportunities, six chances. The client does it two times. So percentage of opportunity data says they were accurate 33% of the time, okay? We got that by dividing two divided by six. Data show 33% accuracy data come from the percentage of opportunities. And then D, duration, we're not taking total amount of time, Second right, duration. of anything. So we're looking at C, percentage of opportunities. Three months into working as a behavior technician, you're asked to attend a community-based intervention for one of your clients. You've never been out in the community with a client and are anxious about how it might go. What should you do? All right, CBIs can be stressful, they can be difficult, but they're very important. These involve us going into public and working with the client. Now, this is specifically asking about a CBI, but this is for goes for anything. If you're a technician and you're anxious about how an intervention might go or or whatever, what do you do, right? What is your what do you need to do in the situation? A, search the internet for CBI tips and information. Well, you don't need to do that. One, you don't know where the information is coming from, and two, this is your supervisor, this is what they're for. So B, reach out to your supervising analyst for help. That's what we're trying to do here, right? If you ever feel uh, incompetent or untrained or stressed or anxious, you've got to reach out to your supervisor. It is their duty and responsibility to help you. C, plan the CBI with the client's parents prior to attending the CBI. Well, your supervisor is going to plan that, right? And then you're going to assist. You're not going to do it by yourself. And then D, refuse to attend any CBIs. Well, no, this might be part of your job and it's an important part of our jobs. So if you're anxious to do what we do whenever we feel anxious or unconfident in any intervention, reach out to the analyst for help. Excellent. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. As always, let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.